does a game designer do and how does someone who wants to get into game design, you know, what kind of skills do they need to, to break into the industry? What are the challenges? How do we communicate to each other? What is, what is game design really like? We're not just building stuff on a screen. We're building stuff for a human being sitting in front of that screen and we're crafting the emotions and the thought patterns and the whole experience they're gonna get. You have to love games, you have to play a lot of games, but that's only the beginning. So you need to start thinking like a designer and not just like a player. Please welcome to the stage, James Portnow, founder of Extra Credits and CEO of Rainmaker Games. And today I have with me Greg Street of World of Warcraft fame, and who is now a designer on League of Legends. And Stone LeBrandy, who's worked on games ranging from Diablo 3 to the SimCity franchise, and who is now with Riot as well. Thank you. So to kick this off, I don't want to ask you anything. I want to ask them something. How many of you want to be game designers at some point? Just raise your hands. Uh, do it. <laughs> the best advice, right? Panel's done, we're over. <laughs> um, no, that's awesome. That actually warms my heart. That's fantastic to see so many people who want to enter this trade. Uh, but there's a lot of misconceptions about what game design is. So I'd like just to sort of start there and see where we go. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about how you see game design? What is game design? So for me, I walk into the office at the beginning of the day, and I say, this is what we're going to do, and I mic drop and walk out and trust that they're going to, you know, finish it all. Oh, that's good. I walk in, and then I just cry? Yeah. Right, that's my job. All right, what about you? Uh, my job mostly is about communication and trying to get the team to all kind of go forward in the same way. Um, super dependent on all of their talents and working with them. Um, but mostly it feels kind of like orchestrating. Um, you need everybody in the audience uh, to all participate at the same time. I really wanted to hit the heart of sort of what is game design? Uh, I mean, for me, I always see it as crafting experiences, right? That uh, the in our title, game designer, design is by far the more important word to me. And this idea that we're not just building stuff on a screen, that we're building stuff for a human being sitting in front of that screen and we're crafting the emotions and the thought patterns and the whole experience they're gonna get. That's sort of how I see game design, but fundamentally, what about you guys? Uh, yeah, for me, it's really the act. It's, it's like a verb that you're trying to get from ideas and criteria. You're getting you know, executive orders, you're getting marketing orders. Uh, all your team has these great ideas. And your job really is to try to take all of that and turn it into a plan. And that process of going from an idea to a plan to eventually a shipping product, that is the act of design. And that's how I really see that role. And that's it, not just true really of game design, but it's true of most fields of design as well. Yeah, fundamentally, we're trying to give players something interesting to do because solving those problems is fun. It's satisfying when you feel smart because you solved a problem, whether it's something simple like get the ladder to put it on the ledge, to climb up the ledge, or something complicated like, you know, orchestrating a team kill in League of Legends. Dive into that. I would love to know more about how you make the player feel smart because that's so much of what we do. Yeah. So yeah, tell me just an anecdote sometime that you've uh, made the player feel smart. Really, you have the framework you talk about when you, when you teach your class that I really like of the, you know, the player wants to get from point A to point B and the game designer puts them an obstacle and then... Yeah, and it's mostly this idea of you can't have your game be too easy because then people will get bored of it, and you can't have it be too hard because people will get frustrated with it. And so a lot of the craft of game design is how do you tune that experience knowing that your audience is going to be all over the map. So you might have young kids, you might have older people, you might have drunk people. Like you don't know when they're going to be playing your game and how they're going to be playing it. And so letting the game kind of become what it needs to be for everybody, it's, I find, one of the main challenges of the craft, uh, whether it's like dynamic difficulty or just the ability for the player to make their own options. And specifically, what you've just talked about is, is Flow Channel, right? Yeah, so the book Flow isn't about game design, but if you want to be a game designer and understand more, I recommend it. It's more just about human psychology because that principle applies to a lot of things in life. So you might say pick up tennis or something like that, and if it gets too frustrating, you're gonna stop, and if it's too easy, you're gonna get bored. So in a lot of things, you get in these flow states that might be gardening, cooking, uh, but for a game, it's really important because players are playing games usually because they have free time in their life, 
And when you have free time, you can do so many things with it. You can watch television, you can go to a bar, you can go see a movie. And for whatever reason, somebody decides, I have free time, I'm going to play a game. And that's kind of a big responsibility because there's so many things in the world people could be doing these, uh, these days. Uh, one of the most important things as a game designer to recognize about Flow is that uh, our players are getting better at the game over time. So the, really the challenge is to make your difficulty ramp up uh, in conjunction with how much their skill is improving so that we've always got them in that Flow channel rather than maybe just starting them there or, or ending them there, right? Uh, but you brought up a really interesting point. Responsibility of game designers. What do you guys feel like the responsibility of game designers is? I mean, we're now a mass medium. There are uh, hundreds of millions of people who play games every day around the world. So what is our responsibility? I mean, I view it as a contract with the player, right? They are choosing to spend time with your game. So in turn, you kind of owe them a good time. And because we want it to be an active media, something where the player is a participant, we need to give them interesting things to do that they, you know, they find fun and satisfying, and like we mentioned, feel smart. Um, they get to see new content. You know, it's always fun to get to the next level, to see new art you haven't seen before, to you know, discover a new boss at the end. Well, and I'd actually uh, argue that a good time is not what we necessarily owe them. We owe them an engaging time. We are pushing past some of the experiences that I at least initially worked on in my career where the goal was only, was only that, right? A good time was fun. Right. But now we've figured out, you know, similar to the way the movie industry has done, that there are a lot of human emotions. And games Shock. don't, yeah, I know. Games don't just have to be about, you know, elation or that, that almost Pavlovian response to rewards, but games can evoke sorrow. Games can evoke fear. There's this whole, like, um, you know, I'm thinking of games like Darkest Dungeon and things like that that have come out now that are just kind of trying to evoke a sense of despair almost. You're, you're not going to win. Yeah, we had, when I worked on the Simpsons game for EA, our, one of our pillars was that we don't want to reward you with money, we want to reward you with laughter. So every time that the player laughs, we're like, that's a type of reward that will make you go forward into the game just so you can laugh again. And that is, that's fantastic, right? And I think that for all of you, the next generation of designers, you guys get to do all the stuff that we never got to do in our career. And so we're gonna put that responsibility on you. Uh, but there is a lot of territory that we're just beginning to explore. And it's amazing in the world's first interactive mass medium, right? Uh, how do you feel like interactivity affects this medium? It is the medium, right? Like Excellent. <laughs> that is actually the answer I totally wanted. It's just one of those things that's really important to realize as a young person coming into this because I meet so many people who have a story and so they say they want to create a game, right? Or they've got a world they see and they want to create a game. And what they really want to do is be a novelist or be a film director, right? So let's go all the way back to the beginning and talk about what we do on the day-to-day -day and what we don't do. Yeah, um, like one thing that's really important for me as one of the lead designers is to understand that whole player arc as soon as possible. And it usually gets into the kind of the details of saying, how long do we think people will engage with this product? Uh, how long will it last from when they boot it up to when they finally get bored of it? Which, you know, it's kind of sad as a game designer, but everybody gets bored of, of most games after some point of time. Except League of Legends. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so if you know, for instance, that the average player is going to play, say like Diablo 3 for 20 hours, then you actually make a timeline that's 20 hours long and you break it all down and you say like, what's going to be going, uh, how long does an act take within an act, the sub acts and so on. And you can break it all the way down to the minute. And eventually if it's an action game like Diablo, you break it down to the second and you're saying, what am I doing? Like, what are the mouse clicks like in that game? And you have this giant chart, which I like to think of as kind of like an orchestration um, where you're looking at the whole thing from beginning to end and getting that mapped out as soon as possible, I find is one of the most valuable things in a game design uh, for a bigger company. So anybody can look at that and understand it. Something we, um, this actually came from when I worked at Blizzard, we would often ask ourselves, who's having fun here? Is the player having fun or is the designer having fun? If it's only the designer having fun, because they're like, oh, look how clever I am. I really, you know, trap the player in the situation they can't get out of, I'm so smart. You know, that, that's not a game people really want to play. You may, you may feel awesome, but no one's playing your game. And I love how both of these sort of get to this idea that uh, what makes a great game is not actually a great idea, it's the refinement of that idea, right? Mario is an Italian stereotype that gets high. Uh, Bioshock is a Anran first-person shooter underwater. 
These are terrible starting ideas that make for great games. I was just gonna, I, I describe game design a lot as, as marble sculpture, where you start with this big block of stone and kind of, you know, Michelangelo-like, although that sounds really pretentious. I was about kinda, to say. Kind of carve away until you have, you know, the barest essence left, but you're adding things back too. It's, it's such an iterative process. You're like, oh, I took away too much. I need to put something back on. Oh, this, this part looks bad. I bet I can make that better. And it's just, it's very cyclical. It always takes a lot longer, you know, than you even want it to take. Yeah, and I find the, um, I use that analogy also, um, that when we have a problem in game design, we first want to say, what can we remove, not what can we add? And I see with a lot of younger designers, they tend to keep layering and layering things on top of things to solve their problems without really maybe taking out the thing that's causing the problem in the first place. And the, I think the more streamlined it is, the easier it is for your players to understand. We talk a lot about the difference between depth and complexity. And ideally, games can be you know, simple to learn but hard to master. And that comes from, from having depth, meaning there's a lot of different ways to, to solve a problem or you're constantly discovering new things rather than saying, oh, I've beaten this, I know what to do. Now, League is a great example of a game that is very complex and also has a lot of depth. But I mean, it is a ratio of depth to complexity, right? There are plenty of games which are very complex that don't actually end up with that amount of depth. And so, sort of you, the reason that players can play for thousands of hours is because despite the fact that it's a very complex game, it doesn't really have a good ratio of complexity to depth. Yeah, and it's not, a, it's not like a teeter-totter where the more depth you add, you know, right. it's, it's back and forth. Like, you want both of them to be as great as possible. You want to be as easy as possible and as deep as possible. Uh, don't trade one off for the other, but make them both uh, as best as you can. So, I wanted to ask you guys a little bit about sort of your design process when you're going attacking a problem. Is there anything that you do, anything you'd recommend to people just sort of starting out, um, any methodologies that you guys practice? If you talk to, like, we work with a lot of artists, and if you tell an artist, hey, go make a monster, you know, their eyes glaze over, like, I don't, I don't know where to begin. But if you give them something to go on, you say, oh, this is a crocodile monster that breathes lava. They're like, okay, I have something now to work with. And I approach game design very similarly. I can't just stare at a blank sheet of paper. I have to, I have to know where I'm going with this. You know, is the problem we're trying to solve that players get bored after a little bit of time? Is the problem we're trying to solve that the game is, is um, you know, the outcome of the game is determined in the first few minutes of the game, and then they're just kind of playing it through for the end. So once I kind of narrow down, really, what are the goals that I'm trying to achieve? Then you can start discussing, you know, the specific ideas that may lead you to that goal. Yeah, and I think the constraints are really, for me, the most important part. And they're not just idea or story constraints. There's money constraints. There's resource constraints. Um, when do you have to ship? Um, all of those things have to be factored into it. And that's something that I think, again, a lot of people outside of the industry don't really understand, is that, like, why isn't that game as awesome as it could possibly be? It's like, because we're humans and we run out of money. Um, and, you know, you've got to deal with that. And you've got to factor that in from day one in your designs and just be realistic about that. And I mean, I think that a lot of people don't recognize that very often the designers actually do know, right? I've never shipped a game that's as good as I know it could be because as you're building the game, you'll see all these other things that you could add in neat power-ups. You'll have all these new ideas as you start to play it. And one of the, I think, the big disciplines as a designer is to tell yourself no, right? That those can be saved for the sequel, but for right now, we've got to make this game as good as we possibly can. Yeah, as far as process goes, um, that's really my process is to start out during pre-production when the team is really small and really um, make, make on one page this outline of saying, this is what our game is all about. These are the elements that are gonna be inside of our game and get buy-in from the executives, from the producers, from the marketing people and say, is this the game that you would like us to work on? And as soon as everybody says yes, you have this one document and it's not detail, uh, but it's showing you the main pillars of the game and the strengths that you're gonna work with. And then take that into every meeting that you go into and just remind people, because it's really easy for in the middle of a meeting, like, I have a cool idea. Like, everybody has cool ideas all the time. And then you just push the paper in front of them and say, can you show me where your cool idea fits on this piece of paper? Otherwise, we're just gonna have to table it till later. One of my big ones is to ask why, because very often we're prone as developers and as designers to sort of jump to solutions, and just as human beings, right? And so my biggest personal discipline was learning to slow myself down and ask, why are we doing this thing? What problem does it solve, right? Do you guys have any moments that you feel like you really hit the next plateau as a designer or something early in your career that you really, uh, that was a big, big step forward for you that you just was an amazing learning point for you? 
I remember really early on in my first game, I was working on Age of Empires. Um, I thought, I knew, I, I kind of understood that game design was about setting visions and trying to keep everyone aligned to, to the idea. But I thought the way to enforce that was to be kind of tyrannical about it, you know? Like, I threatened to quit, I think, of my first week of, of, of development because it wasn't going my way. I think the, the head of the company really wanted to use William Wallace in the tutorial campaign. Obvious to me, that was just capitalizing on the popularity of the movie Braveheart at the time. I felt like we were selling out. I'm like, if this is the first tutorial, I quit. And they were just, thankfully, the other designers in the room just kind of rolled their eyes. They're like, dude, that's not the way to get your way. It's like, be logical, make an argument, come to, a, you know, come to an agreement. Don't just try to throw your weight around to, to force change. Yeah, and I think with me, probably it was realizing that I'm not in charge of the product. I'm just communicating ideas and making sure that everybody understands the product that we're making all at the same time. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to go in and say, like, this is what I want you to do and do it or I quit or whatever. <laughs> Um, but it's much harder, I think, to just say, like, I just love the process of design and watching things flow from one to the other. Um, and so you can't really own your ideas in that way. You have to make sure that everybody on the team can participate and be part of that process. I compare it to, like, sailing a ship. You, you know, you can't tell someone, okay, you pull that rope out, you, you know, raise the anchor, you do this. It's more about, we're going to sail to Spain, okay? You guys know that the vision here is to sail to Spain. Everyone do their jobs to get us in the direction we want to go. And I mean, I think that is a huge part, right? Like we've talked about that communication, teamwork is actually something I look for more in a young designer than actual design chops, right? Uh, and for me, actually, uh, one of my biggest sort of plateaus I can remember was just embracing being wrong, right? No idea springs fully formed from your head, and you're going to get a lot further a lot faster. Your ideas will be better faster if you just embrace being wrong, show them to people, get that feedback, and then work on them again. But as a corollary to that, something else I often see young designers do is because their minds are so quick and they can immediately poke out problems, they short circuit the brainstorming process. So as soon as someone comes up with an idea, someone else will shoot it down. Like, oh, but we can't do that because of this problem. Um, so the strategy that, that I like to employ is separate it into a brainstorm phase where no one can really you know, say no. You're just like, okay, we'll just put everything up on the board. And then the second half of the discussion is, okay, now let's talk about what we can really do. Well, and uh, so for me, I've always found that the best argument is a prototype. And especially today, where you guys have stuff like Unity, God, I wish I had an engine like that when I was back starting. But uh, I just prototype it, right? And a lot of the time, the other designers were right that these things were absolutely not going to work. Yeah. Periodically, it wasn't. So it's saying sometimes just a paper prototype over a lunch break is enough to prove an idea. Like, you don't need to get out Unity, and you don't need to get a bunch of programmers and artists. Um, sometimes just get a deck of cards and some dice is enough to really prove certain ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a specific example of design that you just think is really great, really clever? I know that we can't, probably a lot of our work is NDA, so we may not be able to talk about our own stuff, but is there an example out there in games that you were just like, oh, that's amazing, why, why didn't I ever think of that? Um, yeah, with board games, especially I see this all the time. Um, and one thing I like about board games is that as a designer, I can see the whole design. It's usually in a rule book of, you know, five to 10 pages or so. So it's all exposed on like a computer game where everything's kind of hidden. You have to tease it out over hours and hours. Uh, but the legacy board games, if, uh, yes. Risk Legacy and now Pandemic Legacy, which are these board games that you, if you don't know them, you rip up the cards, you scribble with Sharpie on the board. And so every time you play the game, it changes for the next generation of play. Um, for me, that's one of the things where it's like, this changes things around so much. It's kind of, I'm a game designer while I'm a game player. Well, and it's also brilliant, right, from a corporate perspective. Because you always have to think about these things, and that's one where you're going to buy Risk or Pandemic two or three times if you've got a larger friend group because you're destroying it as you go. Yeah. And also building up to your opening new envelopes and new rules are being added and things like that. Which is totally awesome, right? And from a player perspective, it's amazing. Also moves more units. That's really a great point about the business. I think sometimes people get into game creation because they're approaching from an artistic standpoint. You know, they, they have something they want to say, which is a great start. But you have to ask yourself, you know, if you want to make a living doing this, how are you going to pay rent? How are you going to buy food? And the way to do that is you have to think at the end of the day, this is a product. And that may sound, you know, that takes all the joy out of it to think of making games like making light bulbs or, or tires or Pop-Tarts. But it really is something you have to market it. You have to get players to understand its goal. You have to 
to respond to feedback from the players about what they like or don't like about your product? Well, and we've talked about money being one of your resources, right? Money buys extra people on the team, buys more time to work on your game. And so the more successful you can be as a product, the more resources you will have to execute the vision you want, either on that game or the next game. Uh, but so for me, recently, I saw this game, uh, Random Access Memories. And they had this moment that I thought was genius. It was, it was I'm fairly pretentious, right? And a lot of times, all right, you don't even, that doesn't even It comes with like, the yes, game design. I agree with that. Uh, it is actually kind of true, it is part of the trade. Um, to decide that you should be able to design an experience for other human beings. Uh, but at the beginning of the game, you get to choose your pronoun. And this should be in every game that's not voice acted. Because it's not only he or she, they just let you input whatever pronoun you want which it will swap out and takes two seconds, right? And they'll swap out for every pronoun in the game, in all the text. And for some portion of the audience, that's gonna make them a lot more comfortable playing that game because it's who they identify as. And I mean, that's a five minute technical task, right? So that was one for me. Uh, have you seen anything recently that's been, or, or over your career? I, I mean, there's so many. It's, it's always in the games I don't work on. It's like, oh, that's so good. Why didn't I think of that? Um, I don't know, one that, one that just came to mind, the Lord of the Rings game, Shadows of Mortar, had this really cool system where the orcs you fight and, and fail to kill, but then become stronger. And it's, I think they call it the nemesis system, so that over time you develop this hierarchy of bad guys. And it's very custom tailored to your experience as a player. It's not something that the designers or writers set out to you know, script ahead of time. So it adds a lot of replayability. It, it gives a lot of agency to you as the player. And it's just cool. Yeah. And I mean, I love that system so much that I played, I don't know, 10 hours or so of the game with not even doing the quests. It was just making up my own quests. And I think that that's really a valuable part of a lot of games where you go off the script. It's like, I'm not a part of the narrative that they've set up for me. I've invented my own fun in this world. And that happens like in Grand Theft Auto and other games like Minecraft as well. Well, and even in more linear games, for me as a designer, I always envision the player as part of the art, right? They're, my creation isn't done until someone actually plays it. And their decisions, they're painting out the rest of that canvas. Yeah, and I agree with that so much. I feel like a big part of our job is making a playground for players to play on. And it can be a very freeform game, like a, um, a SimCity or a Grand Theft Auto, which are very different games, but still kind of give a really blank canvas to players. Or something like League of Legends, where part of our intention is to give players choices about masteries and items or even what lanes they're going to play in, and then say, go out, experiment, have fun, see what works for you. Well, and I love the personal narrative that comes out of it, right? The stories that people tell about those epic games they had, right? Uh, and it's really interesting in the Lord of the Rings example, because I actually felt like those stories of this orc politics and orc hierarchy was more compelling. That's what, uh, with Grand Theft Auto in particular, I found that like we would go into work the next day and everybody would have a different story for how they completed the same mission, where you go, you play like another game, um, like a first person shooter campaign game, and everybody solves everything in exactly the same way because there's really only one way to solve it. And if you don't solve it that way, you know, it's very telling as a player. You're like, but there's a door here. I should be able to go through it. Like, no, the developers didn't think that you'd want to go through that door, so it's just painted on. It's not something you can inter interact with. Well, and as a designer, rather than saying, here's a problem, this is the solution, rather I try and present the player with a group of tools and say, solve this problem however you would like. We can't always do that, right? There's a reason that stuff like Grand Theft Auto costs hundreds of millions of dollars. But as a general philosophy, I try and approach things that way. Yeah, I think the, um, the invention game, The Incredible Machine, I don't know if you remember that one from a long time oh, ago, yes. but that was, for me, it really pointed out, this is before I was actually in the game design industry, um, where I played the game and realized like everybody's solving these puzzles in a completely different way. If you're not familiar with the game, it's like a Rube Goldberg thing with gears and mice on treadmills and stuff, and they ask you to solve certain puzzles, but everybody would solve the puzzle differently. Maybe I love that because I feel like that is actually part of our job as game designers too, right? Is to laterally think around these problems. Uh, do you guys all know about the fog in Silent Hill? So this was amazing, right? Silent Hill, they're working on the first Silent Hill and it's PS1 and they want it to be beautiful, right? They want it to be this great looking game and they're running the tech and they're rebuilding and spending a lot of engineering time trying to rebuild the graphics engine and it's just not getting where they want. And somebody goes, why don't we add fog and lower the clipping plane, right? And so now, instead of having to render this whole town, they only have to render like a block or less because it's shrouded in this heavy fog. 
which also added amazingly to the atmosphere and became the signature of the series. And I always love those design ideas where you get to have that moment where you step out of what are our traditional answers, what are our technical answers, and find a solution that's better for the game and better for the team. Yeah, you hear the word elegant a lot in game design meetings. Designers love this idea of, an, oh, it was an elegant solution to the problem. Uh, so we're about to wrap up. Is there anything that you guys want to throw out there? Anything that you really wish to impart to people just beginning on their game design careers? Um, usually my advice for most people trying to get into the video game industry is, as game designers is to make sure that you've actually made a game yeah. not video. Like just get a deck of cards and try to make up a game with a deck of cards and see what you think about that process. Um, a lot of game design is looking at your audience and getting their feedback. So, you know, make up that game with a deck of cards and then give it to two of your friends and ask them to play it and then watch if they would want to play it a second time. And it's pretty easy, I find, to get anybody, especially if they're a friend, to do something once. Uh, but getting them the second time can be a lot harder. Also, play a lot of games. I schedule 15 minutes of my day every day to play a game I haven't tried because you will not even be a good League of Legends designer if all you play is League of Legends. And kind of know what are players talking about, what's going on you know, that's big in the industry. If you can't play every single game that comes out, at least understand when there's a hot new thing, why is it? Is it, is it just the graphics people are excited about or is there some like new idea that no one's ever tried before? And especially when it's something that's comparable to something else, right? Why did this first person shooter fail and this one succeed? Because very often by putting those things side by side, you can see what differences actually brought the audience in. Uh, but these things, I mean, our medium is interactive. These things should be too. The most important thing is actually not what we have to say, but hearing what you guys have to say in your questions. Yeah, just line up in the mic in the middle and feel free to shoot. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Cynthia. Um, and one question that I had is that we're currently, we currently live in a time where a lot of things are becoming independent. So from films, TV, you know, web series and whatnot. And I believe that games are definitely becoming a thing specifically for mobile gaming. So for people that, let's say they can't afford going to a gaming school where they can learn about animation, do you have any tips where they can at least learn on their own? Just real quick, who here took a bachelor's in game design or went to a game school? Right. right. There oh, wasn't wow. such a thing. Yeah, they didn't even exist, but... Uh, I actually started teaching classes in 2001, and at the time there wasn't even that many classes back then, and so I had to invent my curriculum for my students. I didn't really even have a lot to pull from back then. But you were film, you were oceanography, and I was classics. Uh, so, I mean, there's a huge number of resources out there on the internet, but... My number one is actually just jump in and start. I know that sounds really weird, but there's a ton of tutorials for something like Unity, or you can go to paper prototypes, make physical games, just start building games. You'll get better so rapidly if you just, if you just start building. If you can make a game that is vaguely fun, you know, as a card game or a board game, you're really getting at the heart of what it is to, to be a game designer. And we get... You know, I get applications all the time where someone will submit a paper game they made or even like an adventure they wrote for their friends in D&D or something like that. All of that can help you prove that you have game design chops. You don't need a particular degree or, or it doesn't have to be a, you know, digital submission. Yeah, and I'd say the opposite of that is true too. Like you may decide to try that and then it's like this isn't for me. This isn't something that I enjoy doing because it's not for everybody. And there's this kind of illusion from outside that, oh, what a great job. You just sit up and make up stuff and tell people what to do. Um, where really the amount of communication that's involved, it's, it doesn't feel like I'm working on a game as much as I'm writing documents a lot. I'm working with spreadsheets a lot. And so those skills of being able to communicate effectively are probably some of the most important that you need as a game designer. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Hi, my name is Maya. Um, my main question is when creating a game, as you guys have had a ton of experience in your life, um, there's obviously a fulcrum of what you mainly want to give to the customer, but how do you create a game that's so complex that you would need to master it over time that you would have to start on the basis of not mentally eliminating the player as soon as they get into the game? So one of the interesting things about League of Legends is it is a very difficult game to learn. And before I even joined Riot from the outside, I was like, how is this game so popular? It is so impenetrable. It does a really terrible job of onboarding. I'll be the first to admit it. Um, most people learn League because their friends teach them. And I think a, the lesson there is that 
people who play games are often pretty smart. And they're willing to learn a lot of information, even an unreasonable amount of information. Games like Pokemon like bury you in details that you're supposed to know to be effective at the game. So I, you know, it's weird because I kind of have this reputation for World of Warcraft of liking to dumb the game down. But really, I feel just the opposite. I think let players rise to the occasion, you know, put them in an interesting position. And for me, it's always test, right? You take it out to what I call a naive user, right? A user who's never seen the game, who may not be an expert at playing games, and then don't say anything. Just watch how they play the game. Listen to what questions they ask and write down those questions. And then at the end, try and answer them, right? But not while they're playing. And that will tell you all the things that you sort of know inherently as a designer and so didn't even think about because you're so close to this game. You've been working on it so much but that somebody coming in might not know if you want to smooth out that curve. Yeah, in my game design classes where it's all um, non-digital, so dice and cards and board games and things like that, one of the exercises is that they have to write the rules down and then bring them in and give them to two players to play the game, and they can't talk at all. They can only take notes. And if you really want to see what it's like to be a game designer, try that. Like, like I said, get a deck of cards, make up a card game, but then write the rules down and then hand them off to somebody and then see where they get confused. Um, but I guess to answer your other question about just the tutorials or how do we present information, um, going back to the thing I mentioned before where I try to make these big timelines of showing, say, like 20 hours of gameplay, that's all like parts of the beats of the game. You're like, I'm going to show them this mechanic here, I'm going to show them this mechanic here, and you just schedule that all out all the way through the whole experience, and that'll really help a lot. The best advice I could give for tutorials is a lot of games make the mistake of trying to teach players everything. But really, the best tutorials show players while the game is fun. And once they understand that it's fun, they're going to stick with it. And also, don't front load everything. A lot of games try to teach you every single thing up front, even things you're not going to use for a half an hour, and by that point, you've forgotten them, right? Yeah, with text that you have to pause every other screen. That's the worst. Oh. Yes. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, how are you guys? Um, I feel like in gaming right now, we have this dichotomy going on where on one side you've got these critically acclaimed indies like Papers, Please, and on the other side you have these annual franchises, the 500 million Call of Duty you know, blockbusters. Do you feel like there is a middle ground or do you see sort of this dichotomy continuing forward? I mean, part of it is big games are expensive and Similar to, you know, movie and television, it's difficult to get an investor to justify spending a lot of money on an idea that could, that could be a total failure, which is why you see a lot of sequels, why you see a lot of like, oh, the kids like modern military shooters, let's make a modern military shooter. Um, go ahead. Well, no, it's just so funny to me because you're absolutely right, and yet on the other side, modern military shooters is a space that's totally taken up. If you try, I mean, I think you're more risky actually trying to build a modern military shooter. Uh, so it's an interesting prospect. To me, I hope that someday the big publishers start picking up an indie arm where they can make cheaper, uh, more experimental projects, and then if those go well, bring the sequel into their high-polished studios. Sorry. Yeah, and I, and I think there is definitely middle ground. Like, you look at a game like Hearthstone when it came out, and I mean, now it's really huge, um, so everybody's making card games, of course. Uh, but when it first came out, that was Blizzard's attempt to do something in the middle, that like we're not going to make this full-on campaign with all the 3D cinematics and everything. We want something kind of smaller and lighter. Um, so I think there is room there. Um, a lot of times, though, you do need that kind of marketing muscle to get it out in front of people. Thank you, guys. Uh, hi, my name's Dylan. I wanted to ask, could you go into some more detail about depth versus complexity? Because I didn't quite understand the examples you gave initially, and I would like to understand that topic a bit more. Sure. I would define depth as um, not immediately solvable. So you, you give players, uh, I'll just make up an example. In this game, you can use the sword, the axe, or the hammer, and you're giving players that choice of which weapon they want to wield. If the sword does a lot more damage in almost every situation, that's not really a choice. The right answer is to pick the sword. Players are going to figure it out, share that information online, and they've kind of solved that problem. Um, for the rest of their game playing, with, you know, they're not going to use the other weapons. Um, you can then add, okay, in, in addition to having a melee weapon, we're going to have ranged weapons, and then we're also going to have um, single target spells. They're going to have AE spells. And so you're adding all of these additional systems, but if they are all easily solved as well, that's a complex game without a lot of depth. And the more that those systems interact and change basically combinatorically what is best, 
you're going to get more depth out of it. But uh, Go is probably the best example, in my opinion, of a game with low complexity. It'll take you half an hour to learn the rules, if that, with enormous depth, right? We are still figuring out things about Go, uh, and that's thousands of years. And I'd love to see a video game hit that level where we're playing it for decades. Like a counterexample is I love to pick on the game Monopoly, which has a lot of rules and looks very complicated, but at the end of the day, it comes down to who gets lucky rolling the dice. And that's really the decision making system in Monopoly. Maybe you're doing a little bit of wheeling and dealing and making your family members hate you at Christmas time. They do for other reasons. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks so very much. Have a great day. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, so um, you guys sit down and to mention uh, the importance of being able to kind of solve video game design, uh, not just sitting down and being around a computer, but to experience life, to be able to extend out different events and different situations that could help you uh, solve a problem when you're making a video game mechanic. And I just want you to maybe just maybe slightly uh, give a little bit of example where you as developers had to go outside of just from your normal um, being stuck in front of a computer screen, be able to kind of solve a video game problem or design uh, through other different experiences. Oh, yeah, that's super easy for me because I worked on SimCity before coming uh, to Riot, <laughs> and that game is all about looking outside. Uh, there's not a lot of other video games like it, and it's supposedly modeled on some real-life uh, yeah. you know, ideas of what's going on outside your window. So we had to spend a lot of time just like, looking at documentaries, uh, talking to different... Uh, people from like teachers, firefighters, police, you know, trying to understand urban planning. And none of that traditionally is part of game design. Uh, but then take those ideas and then turn them into entertaining mechanics for the players was quite a challenge. So for me, uh, one, I kicked around in a band before I entered the games industry. I used the communication tools to keep a band together across the United States on band monies all the time, much more. I have a master's in entertainment technology. I use that far less than things I learned in a band. Um, and then every game I've worked on, it's been experiences outside. There was a game where knowledge of the flowers of the English countryside was hugely important. There was another game that I worked on where I had never fired a gun. And I realized that I needed to have that experience and understand the gravity of doing that, right? Of pulling the trigger. And so all the time I encourage people to go past, and like my degree is in classics. I bring in things from that continuously. The reason I feel like so many games fall flat on the emotional side is because a lot of them stay only in the realm of game. Yeah, if you saw like what the Riot offices look like on the inside, on every desk you're going to see like action figures. You know, you're going to see stuff from favorite movies and comic books and manga and anime. And I think all of those are great sources of inspiration. Um, you can get, you can learn that almost anywhere. You can see, um, you know, great signage on a building might inspire you to solve a tricky UI problem. Um, I think actually you probably get more from looking outside than you often do looking inside. Yeah, and I was going to say like anybody who wants to be a game designer in this room, you should start studying psychology because it really gets down like why does why do humans even do the things they do? How do the brain? Why does the brain work the way that it does? What makes us want these rewards that we're going to play League of Legends every night for months on end? You know, there's something going on like deep in the brain, and psychologists have spent a lot of time answering those questions already. And the more you can understand about that, the more effective game designer you can be. Well, and that's actually why I love the classics as well as a game designer, because there's a reason that these works have remained relevant after thousands of years, right? And digging into what is fun, that fundamental part of the human experience that they touch on has informed a lot about how I think about games and what the player needs from a game. Because fundamentally, the player isn't experiencing the rules we write, right? They're experiencing the emotional state, even if that's just a power fantasy, right, that rolls out of those rules. Yeah, I mean, and games have been around since the beginning of civilization, so, you know, don't look at this like, oh, what's going on in video games right now? It's like, go all the way back, like, what was the first game that people were playing? And it was probably some form of kicking something into something else, you know, or running, touch that tree first. Yeah. Like, so there's something intrinsic about human nature that makes us want to play, and trying to understand that is, I think, deeper and more important than just saying, like, what's the hit game of the day and I'm going to copy that? Well, in understanding, when I mean, we talk about League of Legends as the biggest game in the world, it's not soccer, right? And it's important that we understand that soccer is bigger, right? Why? 
what is so compelling about those people. And I mean, especially when we start talking about esports, all this stuff, understanding that it's the human experience that's in those games, the human narrative behind those games that makes them so compelling. Uh, but we have time for probably one more question. Oh, perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, so this is very league specific. Um, and it's about the Rift and designing around a Rift. So the Rift's been around for since, you know, the time League of Legends came out. And my question is sort of about designing for the Rift and sort of over time, like taking, I guess, like feedback and ideas from so many people and holding the responsibility of designing for the Rift. And I noticed there's like very small subtleties to just like how the map is designed. So how do you guys sort of like work within the Rift as a design constraint and just sort of like, how do you take on that idea? Because the Rift is so specific, but at the same time, I, I know you as designers want to bring in something new to the Rift, so yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it stuck around for a while because it works for MOBA design. The, the three lanes with the jungle and the, the two bases in the corners, um, you know, I, League of Legends didn't come up with that. That existed long before us, and it's just, we like having a field to play on, much like a soccer field. We don't want the game to be about fighting the Rift. We want it to be about fighting the other team. And the Rift is just kind of the arena in which you have that experience. And can you actually explain a little bit about how it would change the game, how the game is different by having one fundamental map versus having a bunch of different maps to, uh, to play on, right? That may not be as refined or whatever. Uh, and how that affects the player experience. Yeah, like I said, we want players to be able to learn the subtleties, the nuance, the like, oh, I can use Flash to get over this location, because that's a form of mastery. You learn the map, and it gets to be like second nature of, oh, I can try to do this thing here. This is where I should put a ward. These are where the, you know, the raptors are always going to be. And then, so you're not fighting a randomization element. You're really um, getting better and better at the game and spending that energy fighting the other team. All right, so we are out of time. Thank you all. Thank you.